Welcome to the sixth webinar in our ongoing series on Israel's 9-11, the Hamas-Israel War. The webinar is conducted and sponsored by the Atlanta-based Center for Israel Education. I'm Ken Stein, the president of the center and an emeritus professor of Middle Eastern history and political science. Our center's mission remains to educate and inform broadly the general public on all aspects of modern Israel, international relations, Israeli society and identity, culture, and much, much more. Core to our work is the use of timely analysis based on irrefutable sources from a variety of places. We post our materials on the center's website. It enjoys more than 40,000 users a week, israeled.org. Included on the website are our Hamas Israel War webinars. They're all archived, and all you have to do is just click on, click in, and listen. Our center is a standalone 501c3. We've engaged teens, young adults, educators, the general public, the media. Joining us for this sixth webinar are three extraordinary analysts and scholars. Dr. Aaron Lehrman, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Dr. Sarah Foyer, a research fellow at the Gazid Institute in Tel Aviv, uh, a lecturer at the Reichman University's Lauder School of Government. And Dr. Matthew Levitt, who's the Fermor Wexler Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and Director of the Janetta and Eli Reinhardt Program. The webinar today will again look at the war and its influencing variable that impacted Israel and the region, the unprecedented manner in which Israel was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. In these webinars, we've tried to understand, explain, and analyze Hamas's objectives for killing Jews, destroying Israel, or maybe just sucking Israel into a long-term swamp. We've tried to evaluate Israel's military, civilian, and diplomatic responses, and assess how Middle Eastern states and the great powers have responded as well. Today, we'll look in depth at the responses of those countries and populations on Israel's borders and beyond, have a glimpse at how the war is unfolding, and perhaps engage in some intelligent political map making on where it might be headed. This past week, we saw an unprecedented eruption of anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic demonstrations pretty much all over the world, almost reflexive kinds of responses with Western countries and elsewhere being tested as their ability to safeguard free speech. But do these countries clamp down on possible threats to their internal security? We'd like to start off by taking a look at the spider web of underground tunnels and bunkers in Gaza. We'll ask Matthew to help us unfold what that looks like. Matthew, would you start with a discussion of the war, a brief look at Hamas's strategy, and was it the war that they wanted? I think that ultimately this was the war that Hamas wanted. What I mean by that, without trying to be pissy, is that some people thought that when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force of arms, force of arms targeting fellow Palestinians, the Israelis had already withdrawn. This was in 2007. Some people thought that Hamas would moderate. Some people thought that if it wouldn't ideologically moderate, it would at least be co-opted by the day-to-day -day responsibilities of governance. You got to collect the garbage. You got to pay the teacher salaries. And that was never going to be the case. That was a fundamental misunderstanding of what Hamas was all about. Because Hamas doesn't act because of occupation or lack of a two-state solution. It acts because it wants to create a single Islamist Palestinian state and all of what it considers historic Palestine, all of Israel, all the West Bank, all the Gaza Strip. It is opposed to a two-state solution. It is opposed to a moderate or secular Palestinian state. And so for Hamas, governance became a little bit of an ideological crisis. It had to govern. It was now an address that could be targeted if it did things against Israel, but it was never about and was never going to be satisfied with governing the Gaza Strip. And so ultimately, what Hamas did is it invested over time in ways that we in the West have a very hard time understanding because we are societies that are based on instant gratification. But this is a group that was willing to play the long game and see if it could balance governance while finding ways to attack Israel. So it dug tunnels under the border east into Israel to carry out attacks, the type that was used to kidnap Gilad Shalit. It got weapons smuggled in from Iran. It developed its own internal weapons production capability. Everything from shooting attacks to incendiary balloons, it tried it all. And ultimately, what we are now seeing, and we can now recognize in ways that it's only possible Monday morning quarterbacking after October 7th, 
is the extent to which they invested in infrastructure to be able to carry out something spectacular like this. And I think nothing underscores this more than the Hamas tunnel system. I've had the opportunity to be in five or six different Hamas tunnels and a couple more that the Israelis didn't open on Israeli territory where I was able to peer in through spy cameras with like a hose. And these are the smaller, tighter, more narrow tunnels that were attack tunnels dug from Gaza into Israel to be able to carry out attacks. And even these were quite sophisticated. The first ones I ever was in, very shallow, wood supports, flat wood roof, and, and these collapsed a lot. Just a couple of years later, I started going into tunnels where they were much taller, prefabricated cement walls and cement domed roof tracks to be able to facilitate a cart so that you fill it up with dirt, electricity, and a pulley cable system to pull that cart full of dirt back out into Gaza. Telephone systems so that when your shift ends, you can call the next guy, why aren't you down here for my shift, and be able to have conversations that you could have at least more sense that the Israelis weren't tapping. Millions of dollars, two to three millions of dollars a piece just for these smaller, tighter tunnels. This doesn't include the smuggling tunnels dug west into Sinai, and it certainly doesn't include the spider web of tunnels, many of them wide enough to drive a motorcycle through or more, large underground facilities, storage facilities, classrooms, sleeping quarters that are the main critical infrastructure, militant infrastructure that the Israel Defense Forces is dealing with right now. And so one of the reasons that the war right now is so complicated and focused on the northern Gaza Strip is because so much of this infrastructure has been built up over 15 years. I think most people are aware that it's been happening over recent years, but I think few people understand that it's been happening for 15 years under mosques, under schools, under UN facilities, under and in hospitals. And that makes things entirely different. If you are set out now, as I believe the Israelis have to be, to make it so that Hamas can never carry out an attack like October 7th again. I wish the Israelis would stop talking about annihilating Hamas, ending Hamas. That won't happen. We didn't end the Islamic State. We denied the Islamic State the ability to function as a state. We inflicted territorial defeat on it. That's what the Israelis need to do here, to inflict territorial defeat so that Hamas governance project, its safe haven, its ability to train, arm, develop infrastructure, build weapons is over. That has to happen, but that is going to take some time because of this infrastructure that's been built over so many years. You said there were some who believed that Hamas was susceptible to pressure or susceptible to rationality. I don't know if you even use those two words, but there was a belief that you could deal with Hamas as an interlocutor. Where did that belief come from? Or it was just a packed thought, a mindset, a desire to get a peace process going? What prompted that? There's several things that prompted this. The first is just a, a belief that you, you talk to everybody and that Hamas was really most like the IRA more than it was like a Hezbollah or an Al-Qaeda or later an ISIS. The second was that Hamas did win or did best anyway in an election in 2006. And so for many people, okay, so they're now elected. They now represent. And finally, I think many people see Hamas not so much as a theological militant organization, but as a nationalist militant organization. Of course, it's both. It's an overlap of the two. If it's a nationalist, then, and this is just over territory, then you can come to some type of understanding. And Hamas, by the way, over time, especially people like Yehya Sinwar, who spent all these years in an Israeli prison and clearly learned more about the Israelis in prison than the Israelis did about him, kind of pulled a fast one. And he'd periodically talk about a long-term hudna or a truce. You see that even again now, post-October 7th. Some Hamas officials are saying, we did nothing wrong, we'll do more October 7th. Others are saying, no, no, maybe we could talk about a long-term truce again. I don't think that they should be believed at all. I think that this is part of lulling people, as Hamas did, very effectively. Their PSYOPs campaign, their intelligence control, it was painfully effective in convincing everybody, including the Israelis, that they were deterred and that an economic program that brought just enough economic dividends to Gaza could ultimately buy calm. And I think it clearly didn't. And maybe this also explains why in the last rocket war, which was led by Islamic Jihad, not Hamas, Hamas didn't participate because they were already well along towards plotting something much bigger to try and change the entire dynamic. That, again, is not about securing a two-state solution, but about destroying Israel. Let's remember, Hamas began to behave, to some extent, with the help of the Gatarids, 
as a protection racket. Bring us the suitcases. By the way, it had to be suitcases with cash because Abu Mazen in Ramallah was not willing for the banking system controlled by the Palestinian Authority to put a brass farthing into Gaza. For the, as far as he's concerned, they can all die. So it had to be cash from Qatar. And it became a mechanism that sort of helped us lure ourselves into the belief that we are dealing essentially with a racket, not with an ideologically reformed racket, but with a racket. That was a mafia style extortion operation rather than an ideologically jihadi order of priorities. And as Matthew said rightly, The fact that they set out the two rounds we had with Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Iran's directly owned proxies in Gaza, earlier this year and in 2022, basically seemed to confirm this assumption. There was also, I would say, an exaggerated evaluation of the BDA, the Battle Damage Assessment, that we were supposedly able to inflict on Hamas, including the tunnel system, in the campaign that we called Guardian of the Walls in 21. So put all of it together and you have the concept of deterrence, you have the misplaced trust we put on our border protection system, you get the larger conceptual framework that Hamas is becoming an extortion racket of sorts, They have a government that has to feed 2 million, whatever, people in Gaza. So all of this added up to basically a delusion about their purposes. But I agree 100% with Matthew that this is, to some extent, the war they wanted in the sense that they wanted to do something so horrifying, so atrocious, that Israel would be bound to react full force with a caveat that I'll come to in a minute. And the purpose here was not only simply exterminatory, although this is their basic agenda. If you go back to the Hamas covenant of 1988, you're dealing with a Nazi organization that has adopted without reservation the Nazi interpretation of modern history. Read chapter 22 of the Hamas covenant, and you will see that this is basically assigning the Jews the role Uh, that the Nazis assigned to them in explaining everything that happened since the French Revolution. So we know what their basic motivation is. But in addition, there was a a specific challenge. And that was that they were looking around and they were seeing the Saudi-Israeli rapprochement emerging, which runs contrary to what they believe more basically is the Palestinian need to keep the flame of hostility burning. And it also runs counter to the Iranian allies' interests. Hamas works with the Iranians. The Islamic Jihad works for the Iranians. For both of them, Tehran has become the center of the so-called camp of resistance, uh, Mukarama, or the axis of resistance. And therefore, the timing, I believe, is to a large extent related to what they came to perceive as uh, a disaster about to happen from their point of view. And so they launched deliberately a war of such intensity, of such brutal intensity, uh, murderous atrocities, that Israel uh, had no choice but to turn this into a war rather than another round of a few days of exchange of rocket fire. There is one point in which not only they, but some of our best Israeli uh, military minds uh, of the older generation, I'm referring, for example, to a venerable man, General Brick, and others who believed and said openly that the ground campaign in Gaza is going to be a disaster because of the tunnel system, because Hamas has all the benefits of the defender, and they are in a densely populated urban area, and the IDF is going to find it next to impossible to contend with the military challenge involved. And this did not reckon with a very important aspect of Israeli warfare as it is now. 
It wasn't there 15 years ago. I saw the breakdown of uh, intelligence and air and command cooperation in the second Lebanon war, and it was heartbreak. It was already beginning to be on demand by 2008, late 2008, when we went into uh, Operation Cast Lead in Gaza. But by now, the IDF has matured into something else altogether. It is a very effective triangle of ground operations, armored ground operations, with the infantry uh, supporting, very intensely supportive combat intelligence at the tactical and operational level. We may have had a catastrophic strategic failure of intelligence in the worst since, in my mind, worse by far than 73. But uh, in 73 uh, uh, also, and again now, the tactical and operational support for the troops recuperated very dramatically. And now it is at the level of targeting individual threats within seconds of their emergence. And the third element is that despite the fact that all our air assets are Air Force, we don't have Army air assets as the U.S. does. They have learned to work in such close and immediate coordination that basically we can grind any appearance of Hamas against our forces we fight a three-dimensional war, and they are fighting at best one and a half dimensional. They emerge from a tunnel, a one-dimensional landscape of warfare, out into the open, and they are immediately killed because they are observed in a three-dimensional military operation. Matt and Iran explained really well the, the possible motivations for why Hamas did what it did. I think the question now is whether they have succeeded strategically in getting what they wanted out of this. And that is to say, to the extent that Hamas did this because it was trying to, first of all, at least put a, a halt, if not reverse, the process of Israel's integration in the region more generally, and probably the uh, potential negotiation towards some kind of normalization with Saudi Arabia specifically, and to the extent that they were trying to, as some of their uh, spokespersons have said, bring the Palestinian issue, the nationalist side that Matt alluded to, back to the uh, attention of the region and really the world. So I think in the short term, th they may have succeeded in doing that. But the question of whether they're going to succeed in their broader strategic goal is, I think, still very much that the jury is still out. And we saw this most recently at this Arab Islamic summit that took place last weekend in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And there you had a gathering of all of the Arab states and uh, most, if not all, the Muslim majority countries, where the goal was ostensibly to come up with a unified response to Israel's aggression in Gaza and the plight of the Palestinians more generally. And in the final communique that was issued out of this uh, summit, where the optics of it were difficult to, to stomach, I think, at times, you had Iranian and Saudi leaders seeming to, to look very friendly with one another. You had Bashar al-Assad, who himself is I think probably the most familiar with genocide in that crowd attending. There were some very distasteful optics of this. But in the final communique that came out, yes, very harsh condemnations of Israel, sort of what you would expect from a run-of-the-mill Arab League summit anyway. But we also know now that behind the scenes, there were a number of proposals that did not make it into that final communique that would have been even more, I think, extreme, if that's the word. So, for example, there was an idea to prevent Israeli uh, airlines from being able to use airspace over these countries to travel to destinations in Asia. There was a, a thought to kick out uh, essentially American military bases in the Arab world, especially those that were purportedly providing weapons and support to Israel. There was a proposal to use the oil weapon and so on and so forth. And those proposals did not make it into the final statement. 
because of opposition on the part of countries like Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia. So I'll just say one thing about each of these. Egypt and Jordan, their opposition to taking an even harsher position against Israel, I think the leadership in Egypt and Jordan is very worried right now about the developments in Gaza. They do not want, each for their own reasons, to have another refugee problem on their hands within their borders. But there is evidently still a recognition that they have peace treaties with Israel and they are willing to maintain those treaties and avoid taking steps that would really jeopardize the treaties. The UAE and Bahrain and Morocco are interesting because, of course, these are the countries that signed the Abraham Accords with Israel a few years ago. And so there, the the statement that I essentially read into this is they're essentially saying, all right, we're willing to stick with you for now. We're not going back. Despite the terrible images we're seeing out of Gaza, despite the fact that we would much prefer to see a two-state solution and so on. But the biggie, of course, here was Saudi Arabia. And the fact that the Saudis who hosted this event ultimately were able to prevent some harsher statements from making it into the communique, I think has been interpreted rightly as implicitly saying, we're not shutting the door on a potential normalization with Israel. And to the extent that's true, this is a big failure for Hamas. And so for now, anyway, I I don't think that Hamas is succeeding in this sort of broader strategic goal of, one, getting the Palestinian cause to really start dictating again how Arab states behave, and two, stopping Israel's potential integration in the region. While the PA is extraordinarily weak administratively and in the minds of the Palestinians in the territories, You think this was an effort, this was an internal Palestinian effort to tell people in the Palestinian community that we are the address and the PA is not? And then you think it may have been at all an intention on the part of Hamas to draw an Israeli response of a huge magnitude so great that not only would there be condemnation of Israel's reaction internationally, but perhaps Hamas could draw Israel into staying in Gaza and then it could rise again as an insurgency. Those are two suppositions. I have nothing to base it on other than pure reading. Well, I would just basically say yes and yes. All of the the business of the internal Palestinian politics, this isn't a new story. Hamas has been trying to present itself as the more legitimate representative of the Palestinian people for years now. That was part of its raison d'etre from the very beginning. So this time it chose to do something a, a little bit different, but the aim of trying to prove its bona fides as the leader of the Palestinian cause This is just a sort of new chapter in a longstanding book. The question of international legitimacy, I think it is very possible and even likely that Hamas wanted to draw Israel into maybe something of a protracted conflict. It certainly, I think, was assuming that like in previous rounds of escalation between Hamas and Israel, at some point, the clock, the, the international legitimacy clock starts to tick uh, against the interests of Israel. And what we've seen so far is that I think the clock is moving much more slowly than what Hamas would have hoped for. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it, I think, honestly, has to do with the brutality of what they did on October 7th. Part of it has to do with the fact that the IDF has, I think, done a much, much better job this time around of demonstrating precisely what it is up against when it's going into Gaza. So they're getting better at the sort of cognitive side and the narrative part of the war, which we've learned in previous rounds has been really crucial. This competition within the Palestinian political community is not new. There have been at least two points since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip where Israeli intelligence and the Palestinian Authority both said that they thwarted a Hamas coup targeting the Fatah leadership in the West Bank. Uh, I think the most telling thing is that over the past few years, Hamas realized that its uh, ability to to shape the narrative of targeting Israel only vis-a-vis Gaza wasn't working. And so they shifted and they they moved to Jerusalem and to Al-Aqsa. And suddenly it became that Hamas wasn't just defending the Gaza Strip. In fact, they were defending 
all Palestinians, all Muslims in terms of Israel's supposed encroachments and, and activities there. They were looking to expand that raison d'etre that Sarah was talking about. It's kind of like after Israel withdrew from southern Lebanon and Hezbollah had to explain what occupation it was still fighting. And then, look, Hamas had one significant victory here. It has succeeded in putting the whole issue of the Palestinian plight on the international agenda. And many don't understand the distinction between Hamas and Palestinians, don't understand that Hamas doesn't speak for Palestinians. And you look at these rallies going around in the Western world, it's very clear that all kinds of people are sometimes saying things that are almost, sometimes saying things that are explicitly pro-Hamas. Some of them may mean it, some of them probably don't even realize the distinction between Hamas and the Palestinians. But on, on the issue of Saudi normalization, which I completely agree was the precipitant event for why this now, I think when the dust all settles, we'll look back to the 2021 war, the last Hamas rocket war, and we'll see that that's probably when they really started saying, look, we need to bust out of this Gaza box. It's not working for us and our resistance narrative and desire. And it's around that time, by the way, open source that Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran start operating what they describe, not my words, as a joint operations center in Beirut. But I also think that at the end of all this, if you were sitting in Riyadh, if you are sitting in Abu Dhabi or Manama, if you're sitting in Jerusalem, and by the way, I was in the Gulf last week, if you're sitting in any of these countries, at the end of all this, if anything, it's all the more clear to you that we all need to cooperate to counter the threats from Iran and its proxies. If the runt of the Iran threat network, the least capable of Iran's proxies, little Hamas in Gaza, is able to bring the region to hopefully what will only be the cusp of a regional war. Imagine what Lebanese Hezbollah or the Hashd al-Shabi in Iraq, even the Houthis could help contribute to. I see Gulf countries in particular, Arab states in general, being very wary of doing too much publicly, getting too far out in front of things because of the images we're seeing from Gaza. But I anticipate that when it comes to doing things quietly, there'll be tremendous cooperation. There is no sense of, Hamas are the good guys here. Aaron, you've tracked Islamic Jihad a long time, or radical Islam. Can you talk a little bit about radical Islam and the, the triangular relationship between Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran? I think I, at one point, offered the prime minister for one of his speeches the phrase, three poisonous branches of the same tree, or the three branches of the same poisonous tree. Hamas is by its own definition, going back to 1988, a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it is a, a violent branch of the Brotherhood. There have been, of course, violence by the Brotherhood over the years, but there are also elements within the Brotherhood who chose a very different path. There's even a political party in Israel sitting in the Knesset, which sort of has a Muslim Brotherhood ancestry and participated in the previous Israeli government. And, and by the way, reacted very sharply and very decisively to the Hamas attack by basically calling on Israeli Arabs to stay loyal. So the Brotherhood can go in different directions. Hamas has gone in a very specific direction, interpreting its Muslim Brotherhood identity as a mandate to replace the Palestinian national movement with an Islamist template. I can never forget that when they won the parliamentary election in early 2006, the first act of the newly elected deputies was to go to the top of the parliament building in Ramallah, remove the Palestinian national flag and hoist the green flag of Hamas. The day after they realized that this was not very good for the public image and the flag was up again, but the, basically, this is not, as Matt said, it's not a nationalist organization, it's an Islamist organization. The distinction between Daesh, ISIL, Islamic State in Iraq, and the Levant, which is the accurate translation, in Hamas is that the Daesh are willing to kill everyone, and Hamas is focused mainly on killing Jews, although they killed quite a number of non-Jews on the 7th of October including Arabs, including Bedouins, including clearly identified Muslim women. But mainly their purpose is to kill Jews. Of course, if you happen to be Jewish, this is a distinction without a difference. And then there's the third element, the Iranian Shia variation, 
on Islamism. Not all Shia. We have strong Shia friends in Azerbaijan. Iran's variation, totalitarian Islamist funeral principe, Vilayet Fakir, what Iran made Shiite Islam to be, is a challenge not only to the existence of Israel, it's a challenge to the regional and global order. They basically say the wrong people won in World War II, and it's time to overthrow the entire international dispensation, the regional dispensation, and Israel is the symbol of that ambition. Matthew, I'd like a readout, if you could provide it, on Nasrallah, Hezbollah, as it sees this thing unfolding. They've taken six weeks. They sort of ratcheted it up just enough, like a fly coming across <laughs> someone's face, and you have to keep swatting it away. So this is a critically important and sensitive issue. And I'm going to caveat what I'm going to say and start with a mea culpa. I think all of us, especially that follow Hamas and Hezbollah, we need to start by reassessing our paradigms and our assumptions. None of us called October 7th. I participated in a Black Swan event where you try and think forward. This is, of course, because the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War was coming. And think about very unlikely events that could have oversized impacts. None of us came up with anything like this, despite the fact that the Deputy Secretary General of Hamas, Salah Halaruri, in August did an interview with a Hezbollah outlet saying, we're preparing for regional war. So I still think that Hezbollah overall does not want full-fledged war with Israel. I mean, it would love to have full-fledged war with Israel if it thought it could destroy Israel. But in the moment, it understands that it can't. It doesn't want to invite that kind of retaliation that it knows would come, especially given the political crisis and even more importantly, the economic crisis in Lebanon. Really, nobody other than the most hardline people in Hezbollah, nobody in Lebanon wants Hezbollah to drag the country into yet another war. I think Iran, perhaps ironically, because Iran obviously wants to destroy Israel, also doesn't has, want Hezbollah to do too much and draw on a huge Israeli response because the 150 to 200,000 rockets that Hezbollah has, certainly the most capable of these, are really there to prevent Israel or anybody else from attacking Iran's nuclear program. And if they do, to be there as a second strike capability, and they don't want those knocked out. We've all been saying this for a long time, but... Hezbollah wants to be seen as participating in this, even though it didn't get advanced notice, we're told, and is annoyed by that, advanced notice of October 7th. And so Hezbollah has, as I've written recently, an escalation ladder. Uh, and the first tier is targeting mostly military targets one to three miles into Israel. Uh, Israeli officials tell me they can tolerate that for a long time, even though it means a whole bunch of communities, including Kiryat Shmona, which is what, 20, 25,000 people have been evacuated. I mean, a lot of people are aware the communities in the south were decimated and therefore are empty. They weren't evacuated, they were slaughtered, but others have been evacuated. The ones in the north have been evacuated. And that's hard. But Hezbollah could go a next level and start targeting more civilian targets. There have been a few, but they've been the exception that proves the rule, mostly military targets. And they could target farther into Israel, where there are larger military bases, where there would be larger civilian and military casualties. Many of these bases are quite close to villages and towns. And then finally, they could start doing things 10 to 40 miles in, which would be intolerable and a full-scale war. There are a small number of desalinization plants, electrical grid facilities, critical infrastructure that Hezbollah could take out and make life very, very difficult for Israelis. But they understand that the Israeli response would be overwhelming. And so one of the things they're doing is trying to find ways to do things that will mitigate the response. So for example, the first anti-tank guided missile attack they did into Israel, they targeted an IDF vehicle that they knew was empty. They have given Hamas, and Hamas has militant capabilities in southern Lebanon now, they've given Hamas the okay to do things. So some of the rockets that were fired further into Israel over the past few days that had been the case, those were claimed by Hamas. Now, Hamas can't do anything in southern Lebanon without Hezbollah's okay. There's really very little likelihood that these were somehow Hamas's independent rockets. This is Hezbollah saying, okay, Hamas, you go do this. And, but right now it's kind of tolerable. How long does it go on? From Hezbollah's perspective, so long as they're carrying out some strikes, hitting Israel, pulling forces to the north, they'll probably be satisfied. However, what happens if it really seems that Israel's about to be on the precipice of successfully dislodging Hamas from Gaza? Does Hezbollah say cut our losses or they say it's intolerable 
what happens if it flips and, and something goes really poorly for the IDF? And Hezbollah says, wait a minute, now's the moment to get in on the final destruction of Israel. I think in the West, we don't spend enough time taking seriously when our adversaries tell us what they think. And we tend to downplay it when they're talking theological. And Nasrallah has been saying for years that he believes, and we need to believe that he believes, that Israel is weaker than a spider's web. And then things start happening that vindicate, from his perspective, vindicate his prediction, his prophecy. Severe communal tensions within Israel, severe political tensions within Israel. Air Force fighter reserve pilots saying maybe they won't come to training, which obviously is now very much the past. Hamas has unified Israel in ways no one else could have. But if something happens and goes wrong for the Israelis, does Nasrallah think, wait a minute, no, I was right all this time. Now's the time to get in. If we only get in big, we could actually destroy Israel. I think we all, and I'll start with myself, I need to reassess our calculations and understand that the likelihood that they don't want war because of things in Lebanon, because of pressures from Iran, that's all true. And it still might not be enough to prevent this from escalating and getting out of hand. Sarah and Aaron, as we conclude, are there any concepts or myths or mindsets that we need to, as analysts or as scholars, sort of put back into the pot and say, maybe we need to question them. Maybe even some very fundamental ideas that we've been following, <laughs> or pursuing, or advocating in the last 5, 10, or 15 years. Here, I give credit to my good friend, Nina Shuka, who wrote a PhD on this question. The myth that Western society and Israel is a Western society, enjoying life, engaged in the pursuit of happiness in the Jeffersonian sense, that they are too vulnerable to losses, to military losses in battle, to actually be able to face the consequences of warfare. That actually turns out to be wrong when the level of grievance and the intensity of purpose unite us. We've taken about 50 military losses since the ground incursion began, lives lost, and then about 300 in the battles of October 7. And Israeli society remains as resolute as ever. The only question that may delay further action is the need to gain the release of the hostages. But it, in terms of the willingness to sustain op military operations despite the losses, I think this is one myth that needs to be reconsidered. True enough, the, the ratio of losses for Hamas in a situation where they are the defenders and the IDF is the offensive force, the ratio is supposed to be three to one in favor of the defender. The ratio of losses has been more or less 100 or 80 to one against Hamas. So that tells you something about their mistaken assumptions about the idea. But the willingness of Israeli society to see this through, determined to see this through until Hamas is no longer a functional military or government presence in Gaza, I think tells you something. I can think of two maybe myths or paradigms maybe that we need to start rethinking. One is for the wider, at least Western world, although maybe not only, and the other is specifically for Israel. So the one for the West has to do with how we think about and study and try to understand movements which are ideologically motivated, whether that ideology has to do with a religious orientation. In this case, that's the, the most sort of obvious example. Iran mentioned earlier that the Hamas is linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. So for decades, the debate uh, among uh, mostly Western academic scholars who were looking at the Brotherhood, all of its branches across the region, and even sort of outposts in Europe and elsewhere, the big debate was, okay, is this really a, a moderate movement? Is it pragmatic? How radical is it? All these terms that were thrown around and I think that there is sometimes a difficulty in the West of understanding because maybe a lot of the scholars who look at these movements are themselves pretty secular. It's hard to identify with 
uh, a movement that really believes what it believes. It is not just saying things. I think we're going to have to sort of re-evaluate how we even study groups like the Brotherhood and obviously Hamas. I guess the myth that I would just point out for Israel, and I don't know if myth is the right word, but I think for a while, Israel convinced itself, and there was a lot of evidence to support this idea, that the Palestinian issue was no longer really going to be a major problem for Israel. We had essentially managed to, since the Second Intifada, yes, there were occasional eruptions of escalation with Hamas, but by and large, you have a generation of Israelis who have grown up lucky enough not to have had to deal with a major incident with the Palestinians. And so we basically convinced ourselves that, first of all, we had much, much bigger threats to deal with, and we do, and also that Israel could pursue a peace with the neighborhood. Um, and okay, it would be nice to solve the Palestinian issue, but it's not going to stand in the way now of moving forward. To some extent, there's also a lot of evidence to support that. But I think that with everything that has happened in the last month, I think there has to be at least a sort of revisiting of the uh, assumption. And there were Israelis, including in the defense establishment, who took issue with this argument that the Palestinians were no longer really going to be a problem for Israel. So we need to, I think, probably start listening to those voices, uh, at least including them in the conversation a little bit more. Going back to the question of Hezbollah and the Iranians, I don't believe that there can be a breakthrough towards coexistence with the Palestinians as long as the camp of resistance hovers over the horizon with an alternative to a compromise solution between our two peoples. As long as there are enough Palestinians enticed and seduced by the vision of Israel's elimination that Iran and its proxies are offering, uh, it's going to be uh, next to impossible to move forward. So basically this war ultimately will not end with Hamas being broken in the battlefield. We need to take into account that down the road, we would still have to deal with Hezbollah and with the Iranian challenge. That's a very good way to conclude our sixth webinar. If you like what you saw or heard today, please go to our website and help us continue by making a donation. Please understand that next Wednesday, we will be meeting again. We will have Shai Feldman and Alan Makovsky, a third person still to be determined. 